when he rose from the dead, are you hearing me? It is not enough that we just sing that Jesus rose from the dead. The evidence that he rose from the dead is that he gave gifts unto men. You know, in Acts chapter 2, when Paul, I mean, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, and he was explaining that these people are not drunk, if you remember, by the time he came into chapter 2, I think verse 32, he said, this Jesus, God has raised, and is now seated by the right hand of the Father, and he has received the Holy Ghost, which he has shared abroad, which you now see and hear. So you see the outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which every church member is entitled to, is the gifts of his resurrection. And unless we particularly begin to teach that as our master rose from the dead and led captivity captive and destroy and disarm principalities and power and made a public show of them by triumphing over them in the cross. He gave gifts spiritual gifts that God can, and you know this is not just ordinary talents they are not just natural talents they are spiritual enablements and I'm praying that you will go back and you will see that your church members are endowed with spiritual gifts to function. Church has become stagnant because the gifts for its members to function have not been allowed to operate. Don't forget that I'm dealing with, I'm not dealing with Pentecostal here. This is, this has nothing to do with Pentecostal or no Pentecostal. Anyone who is born again, who has been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, he gave gifts unto men. It is actually a misunderstanding when things of the Holy Spirit was now made to look as if he belonged to the Pentecostal group. It's an unnecessary backsliding. And when I see some people and say, I'm Pentecostal, I say, stop talking. Don't be arrogant about that. There's nothing that makes you Pentecostal. I'm also Pentecostal. All of us, we came out of Pentecost. It is not the exclusive right of anybody. And that's why, you know, I love singing all the hymns. Look at the hymns we are singing here. Look at the hymns. Spirit divine, attend our prayer. You know that all the seven verses of that song, they were by the Holy Spirit. It was not created by a Pentecostal church. This was an Anglican hymn. Which means our fathers who were Anglican, they were Pentecostal. They knew the power of the Holy Spirit. It was backsliding that made it now look as if that is not part of our liturgy. And you don't need to go away from the Anglican or Methodist before you can be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can begin to see the release of the anointing because unto every one of us has been given grace according to the gift of Christ. Now, but tonight is not the night to begin to deal with how to Release those gifts for the growth of the church. I'm just dealing with your own ordination. And I needed to note this. That you are not ordained, are you hearing me? Because there is no grace in people's lives. Your ordination is not because there are no grace in the lives of people. We need to understand this. It's looking complicated. I will show you now. So if unto every man has been given grace according to the gift of Christ, 
If unto every one of us had been given gifts of the Spirit for the common good, you want to ask, so what is the need for a pastor? What is the need for the, the prophet? What is the need for the evangelist? What is the need for the teacher? Now let's see the need. Let's see why you are ordained. Why God has brought you into the ministry, particularly at this time. Are you there? Are you there? Verse 11 and verse 12. Now, because of the usage of some of the words, I want all of us to please turn to that passage. And I would like to crave your indulgence if you can read it from uh, two or three different versions just to make it a little more explicit. Uh, can I beg? Now I've been asking, where is NIV in this meeting? Is there an NIV? Where is it? Where are you? Let me appoint. Can I appoint you to read NIV? Eh? Now you will read NIV Ephesians chapter 4. You are reading verse 11, 12, and 13. Is there any good news in this meeting? Yeah, good news. So, you will help me read good news, sir. Chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13. Where is King James? I've been reading King James. So, uh, where is that King James reader? The lady? Thank you, our sister. You read King James? Now, uh, you read something for me the other time. Where are you? The New Revised Standard Version. Where are you? Yes, sir. You will help us read chapter 4, 11, 12, 13. Is that okay? Is there anybody here with Amplified Bible? By any means, there's an Amplified Bible in this meeting. Where are you? Yeah. Thank you. You will stand up and read Ephesians 4, 11, 12, 13 from Amplified Bible. Um, New Living Translation. Yes, Auntie, you will read New Living, Living Translation. Translation. So let's begin. I'll begin from the sister who is reading the King James, Old King James Bible. Please quickly. Time is not our friend. He gave some apostles and some prophets, yes. Some evangelists. Some pastors and teachers, yes. Now, you know this passage is very difficult to read. The reason is this. You will notice that since she started reading from verse 11, those of you that carried Old King James Bible, all of you that have Old King James, look at it. You will notice that there was no full stop. No full stop at the end of verse 11. No full stop at the end of verse 12. You will notice that at the end of verse 12, what you had is not a full stop. What you have? Full colon. Full colon. You use full colon when the sentence you are making has not finished or you needed to make explanation. Are you, are you understanding? Now, go and see where the full stop came from. Where, where do you find full stop as you are reading? Eh? Sister, go and look for full stop in that thing you are reading from verse 11. Eh? You will see only full stop at the end of verse 16. So you see, there's no way you can understand this passage unless you read from that verse 11 non-stop to verse 16. Non-stop. Non-stop. If you quote anything from there and you did not read that scripture to verse 16, you will misquote it. Because it's one sentence. One long sentence that this man of God was compelled by the Holy Ghost to make which was but the 
the definition of the reason for your ordination. In that one sentence, one very long, long, long sentence, very pregnant sentence, you find the nitty gritty of our ministry. What exactly have you been ordained to do? So, now read until you can find your full stop. You will notice that after that is a new subject that God raised. Have you noticed that? So, but because time will not permit us tonight, we will be coming back to deal with this very seriously from tomorrow. Because that is what captures the reason for your being here. And unless you understand that singular mission statement of every preacher, you may be causing confusion in the body. But let's take it little by little. What makes it easy for me to take it little by little? Do you know why? There are punctuations. Did you see that there are punctuation marks? There are uh, commas. There are semicolons, you know, there are full columns, which means you can even pause in order to understand what you have read so far before we get to the full stop. So that's why we can read and take it little by little. We're going to take a bit briefly now before we go away. And he gave some. Again, King James put the word comma. He gave some apostles. You could read it like he gave some apostles. You could read it like some apostles. But no. He gave some apostles. What do you mean by some? He gave some, some of the body, the people that to help them is an apostle. He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelists. He gave some pastors and teachers. But for one purpose. For a purpose. For the perfecting. For the maturing of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, let's take 11 and 12, and, and yes, 11 and 12, meanwhile, from all the versions we have noted. So, can we start sir, a new revised standard version? 11 and 12. New revised standard version. Some of the apostles, some prophets, some prophets. Uh -huh. Wait. Wait, wait, are you? I, I, I want, I want them to follow you. Don't sit down yet. You will read again. Don't sit down yet. You are a pastor, so you stand along with me today. Now, <laughs> Hallelujah. He said the gifts he gave. What? That some. Are apostles. Some are prophets. The, now we'll be talking about that 
tomorrow. These are ministry gifts. Gifts. Or what we call the resurrection gifts. Men and women that God decided to give to his church for some specific purpose. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. What were they to do? Yes, sir. Verse 12 now. To equip the saints to chop the saints. I'm not hearing you. To chop them, to sit on them, to rule them, to use them, to impress them. Or to oppress them. What did he give them for? To equip the saints. Yes, to equip the saints, yes. For building up the body of Christ. Good. He said he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. To equip the saints for the work of ministry to build the body of the church. Christ. So let me ask you, who are the and people to again, build the church? It's the saints. You are not the one. You see, unfortunately, you always thought that you are the one to do the ministry. That's why what every member of the church should have been doing to build up the church. The pastor in charge. The vicar in charge. Every other person is rendered redundant as onlookers. Who should pay the pastor to do the job? That's where the job, that's where things are lopsided. No. When God raised you up, either as apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, it was for one purpose. What was it? To equip these brothers and sisters for the work of ministry to build up the body. Can you understand? So what would have been your job? What is your job? Equipping the saints. To equip them to know how to do the work. To get some of them and say, this is how to preach. And to show them all the secret of preaching. And to give them opportunity. To do what? To preach. Ah, he said, eh? They will do my job. They will think that I will be redundant. Because you don't understand why God raised you. It's not clear. What is the reason for my ordination? So if you are doing well, actually, you are in a parish for three years. God expects that the parishioners, the members of that parish, you have equipped them to be able to do the work of ministry to such a point that when you are not there nothing is lost actually God can send you again to go and equip others but now I see so many churches where even your members you have not equipped them to bury 
And what is the big deal about burying the dead? Isn't it a hack essay? You know, but you see, something makes you feel that that's your speciality. You feel that that's what you are licensed to do. That that was what you were ordained to do. No, 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 no. You are not ordained to bury the dead. You are ordained to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You have a bigger work to do. You are called to equip the living and not to bury the dead. But you see, don't misunderstand me. Don't go away from here and say, Brother Billy, say we should not bury the dead again. Please, bury the dead, please. Is that all right? When somebody dies in your, par in your parish, please go and bury the person. The only thing I wish you would do is that before you accept to bury the dead, make sure you have equipped him for heaven. Don't bury a man to whom you have never preached. You have no right to bury a man that you never preached. Where are you sending him? <laughs> no, this is hard. This is hard. This is hard. <laughs> It's okay. Forget about that so that we can go. Bury the dead. But don't forget that you are not ordained to bury the dead. You are ordained to equip the living for the work of ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. And if they, if they die, they should have been ready for heaven. Because you see, God has given you an anointing to preach the gospel. To do things that prepare men for heaven. And, and that, that if at all you have to even go for a funeral. Can I inform you the truth in this? The man who is dead. Do you know that the man who is dead? That is in the casket. No matter what you say. Does he hear you? Whether you are dancing or you are weeping. Does he hear it? Honestly speaking, funeral is not for the dead. Honestly, whether you bury a dead man or you don't bury him, does it concern you? are not talking to me again. We have only come with unnecessary sentiments. If you don't bury your mother, your mother will not quarrel you. Speaking, she will lie down there. It is when she's smelling that you who I wanted to be alive you have to bury her. It's for your sake. sake. You bury the dead not for the sake of the dead. For your own sake. Okay. Okay. So, so if I have opportunity and I've had opportunity you know, I've had opportunity to go and bury the dead but in my mind and it, it was only an opportunity to reach the living. Because sometimes I forget that we have not buried the dead when I'm dealing with the living. And I said, listen, this person has finished. There's nothing we are doing for him again. He's finished. You may kill 20 cows for your mother whom you did not feed when she is alive. You are not doing big, big, big man here as if you are a big man. When this woman was alive, you did not do anything for her. What right do you have to wear big dress today? Then the church is quiet. What am I dealing with now? The living. And I hear this woman say, Weep not for me. Weep for yourself. 
Weep for yourself because you are not ready for heaven. Weep for yourself because the work of your hand is not yet straight. You should have been the one to die. But God is having mercy on you because if you die today, you will have gone to heaven. How many of you want to be ready for heaven? Let's pray. Then you give your altar call. Anybody, are you hearing me, can cast the casket to the ground. In fact, when I finish doing that, anybody can do the other one. Marching to the graveside is nothing big. Putting it down, whether you turn it left high or down this, it's not a matter. But you know, sometimes, unfortunately, you think that those are your specialities. You are equipped to equip men. Thank you, sir. Now, verse 13. Let's see, verse 13 from New River Standard Version. Uh -huh. Did you see the extent to which the word of God is demanding? That we will equip the, the saints until the every one of us come to the fullness of the stature of the life of Christ. Right. Where is good news? The person who was to read me good news. Yes, sir. Verse 11, 12, 13. It will all be a repetition now. Mm. How many people are to do the work of Christian service? All God's people. All God's people, not just pastors. All God's people. But for them to be prepared to be equipped to do it, that's why he raised prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, apostles. Go read it, sir. Now nah, go. Okay, we want to call Christ. Kindly, ne? What is your not to us okay? Okay, Christ. Kai we to to. Ro no go go or to Christ. I'm stopping them from getting to verse 14 because I verse 14 is dealing with that we will no longer be tossed to and fro. But we're not there yet. We don't want to do that tonight. We we'll get there by God's Christmas. Now, where is Amplified Bible? And this gift is for a very appointed where a Ndiozi did you see that? That is his intention. God's intention for raising you is that you will equip the all Christian people for the work of service. Go ahead, read into verse 13 now. Go where? Make you to do not to. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. When I come back tomorrow, I will begin to deal with the content of our commission. When will I say I have achieved ministry? Is it when they attended church services? Now that will be taking us onto the critical instrument of achieving what God intends for his church. Brothers and sisters, I want you to attend to this matter because I believe some of the issues that have been omitted is what brought the church in South Africa to what it is. Where largely supposedly to be a Christian nation. But you can see what is going on. You can see that all the men that we put in politics, they were one way or the other members of local churches. How did they become like this? How are they sitting down in the in the in the okay. judges chairs? And homosexuality over how words. They're they're they they're all how did they become that? And I want to tell you that there's no other way to correct the correctness. Did you understand what I'm saying? It will not change until we change it. So what we are talking about here tonight, it might look, it might look little in your eyes, but that's the way forward. I'm trusting that by the Holy Ghost and by the working of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, something, it may look like a spark, we begin from here. Every big flame is but a little spark. So, why am I confident that speaking to a few hundreds of people here could bring revival? It's because fire, correct fire doesn't begin big. Most fires started with only a spark. But if it is nurtured, it becomes big. Some of you are sitting here today. Some of you are sitting here and you have the next bishop who will be ruling some dioceses later on. And if you get it right, Nobody could predict how far what God is doing with you will go. But let's get it right. Let's get it right. May the Lord help us. Let's read the last one. Uh, where's the last verse? I mean, the last version that we have not read. Mm -hmm. NIV. What are you reading? Oh, Living Bible. This NIV, yes. Let's read NIV before we read Living. NIV before Thank you. I go up and to I go you have to read New Living. All right, yes. Okay. It was he who gave some to the apostles. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Living Bible. Living Bible. Abu Ufiha Kaina Ago, Ye Chineke, Jiriwe, Ye Unyendia, Bomakagene, Aboya Kana Gubua, 
Why is it that he gives us these special abilities? Yes. Uh -huh. Christ. But we are coming back tomorrow. I na na chite etinina. I will be trusting God. That for the rest of tomorrow. Na as we begin to deal with the practice. Of our ministry, fulfilling our ordination to grow the body. We will be looking at practical tips. For us to do that and do it well, the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. But tonight, let me request that we will stop here. One question I don't want you to forget is, what is the reason for my ordination? Why am I here? Why, am I being, why have I been given this privilege of being a minister? Why would God capture a man like me? For what? What does God want to do in the church by my life? Paul was clear about it. Peter was clear about it. He told Titus, said that the reason we left you in Crete is to do this. He told Timothy, the reason why you are ordained is to achieve this. Why did God give you the best gift that he gave you? Those things you know how to do best, why did he do it? Our first response tonight is to recognize that God had given you a position in the body of Christ so that his divine purpose may be accomplished. What's the reason for my ordination? Why did God take me from what I'm doing before and brought me here? Must I die? Not fulfilling that reason. The hymn writer say, Must I go empty? Must I meet my Savior so? Must I only go with empty stories? When I've been given opportunity to make a difference. Paul said, Woe is me! Who is me if I preach not the gospel? Because the dispensation has been given to me. There are certain things that has entered my own heart. I feel that God in his mercy has given me certain things that I am responsible to bring to my generation. I, 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 I walk every day under that sense. Something tells me, if this is not done, it will be your fault. If this is omitted in the body of Christ while you are alive, it is your fault. That makes me restless. That pushes me almost every night. That, that this is my duty. Others may go about plucking flowers. I am not ordained to do that. Others may be using the pulpit to shout and to make noise and to impress themselves on people have not been ordained for that. Something tells me that if you don't do this, something will be wrong and you'll be held responsible. Have you caught a sense of your own ordination? Do you know why you are in the ministry? Are you sure? Can you write it down in two, three sentences? This is the reason for my ordination. This is what I was born and born again to accomplish. This is why I didn't die young. This is why God gave me all the opportunities he gave me. And I dare not waste my life 
until this is done. It was men that understood the ordination that could finish it. Listen, if you don't know where you are going, how will you know when you have arrived So Paul would say, I have finished. Because he knew when he started. And he knew where he was going. When he had not finished, you know, he said it. He said, brethren, I can't not myself as having apprehended. Because he knew. He knew where he was. He knew where he is now. He knew where he should be. And he never allowed anybody to deceive him. He knew. Let me put it to you this night. Do you know what you were ordained to accomplish. And do you know how much time you have left to accomplish it? We are going to pray tonight. We are going to sing that our song again. I have reserved my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come and take your own. My spirit, my spirit, my body, my soul, I give to you once and for all, not bit by bit. I lay them all on the altar for you. Oh Lord, please come take your own. I want you to pray. I don't know how many years you have been in the ministry. You need to ask yourself again. The reason for my ordination is it getting done? Am I achieving it? As years are rolling in and out over me, am I achieving my purpose? Is my life already a clear contribution unto the purpose of God in my generation? Paul has finished his own, that's why we are reading about it. And no matter how we talk about Paul, we cannot have him again. Eh? You know, I was eager to come to South Africa some years ago after having read the story of Andrew Murray. Some of you don't know Andrew Murray, but you have read some of his books. Absolute Surrender with Christ in the School of Prayer. In the School of Obedience, if you have any book on Andrew Murray, this man grew in South Africa. This man was used of God. He was one of the early founders of the Dutch Reformed Church. There are things that they, they discovered when they were crying for revival. He said he was praying one day and God said, you know, whether in the Anglican or in Dutch Reform, there is what we call this, the, 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 the Sunday of Pentecost. Do you remember? And we normally count 10 days after the ascension. Eh? You call it, is it Epiphany or something in the Anglican? And this man said, why don't you engage those 10 days after ascension to seek the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he brought the synod together, he shared that with them. And they embraced that for 10 days before the Pentecost Sunday, they were going to wait, study the Bible, fast, pray, and seek for the power of the Holy Spirit. And that thing that he did brought a lot of revival to the churches in his own days. I know if you go to the Dutch Reformed Church now, it has become a tradition. If you go in their midst now, they, they have 10 days they call uh, seeking the Holy Spirit. But it's only a form now. But now, these men serve God in their own generation. They are gone. You don't have another generation to serve apart from this. I want you to know. This is your own generation. And what you do here will go on record. Are you going to rise and respond to the reason for your ordination. Why are you alive? Why has God brought you into the ministry at a time like this? As we pray, 
it must it will be a personal prayer to be a personal commitment you are going to sit down and say have I taken my position or have I allowed opposition to rob me of my own position Lord do something with my life some of you are doing well but you are not doing well enough you could do better. The Holy Spirit is saying there's so much more you could do that you have not done. I'd like you to pray tonight and say, Lord, let me not die until I have fulfilled the reason why you call me. Until I have apprehended the reason why you apprehended me. Until I have captured them. Why you captured me? Give me no rest until I have been able to put, put, put to, put to shape the purpose for which I have been ordained. Would you like to pray? Would you like to pray? Eh? Let's pray together. Thank you. While we are praying. I want you to take that hymn, page 24, and you're going to sing verse 2 and 3. That's the only song I want you to sing, 2 and 3. I have reserved my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come take control. My life must serve your purpose, Lord. Living for you and dying to serve. My all I give your will to serve. Oh, Lord, come take control. I have released my whole being to you. Oh, Lord, come take your will. My heart, my soul, my body. Lord, once and for all I not be by this. I lay them all on the altar for you. Oh Take your own. We'll sing the song. And as we're singing it, you will now turn it to prayer. I have risen my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come take control. I have reserved my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come take control. My life must serve your purpose, Lord. Living for you and dying to serve. My all I give we will to serve. Oh Lord, come take control. Stand up to again. I have reserved my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come take control. I have reserved my lifetime for you. Oh Lord, come take control. My life must have my purpose, Lord. Living for you and dying to serve. My all I give, your will to serve. Oh Lord, come take control. I am really. Release my whole being 
Turn it to God in prayer. Mara ba 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 ba, meka tulu busha kala ba. Onti yo, ikara ba ba ba, me la busha le ba zaga la ya. Ah, ba 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 ba, meka tala busha kala ba. Kira Oh Lord, renew, renew, renew the fire, ma. Lord. And yes, I know more on our side. Time is running away from us. Lord, do a new thing in our midst tonight. Set us a place, O God. Lord, we have reserved our lifetime for Him. O Lord, come and take control. Oh Lord, my life must serve your purpose, Lord. Living for you and dying to serve. My all, I give your will to serve. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. Maybe for years. You have simply been just moving about as a routine. You lost your purpose. And you ask God tonight. Inject a fresh purpose for me. Give me a clarity of my ordination. What's the reason why you have ordained me? Why am I here? Why am I here? What are the things I'm supposed to have accomplished in my lifetime? Lord, do a new thing with me tonight. Thank you, Lord. Once more tonight, I believe God brought us together. He wasn't waiting until the end of the day when we'll be called to give account. And there will have been so many, many gaps 
of omissions, neglected duties. I believe God brought us at this critical point to bring renewal to our hearts. It's possible that you become so slack with the reason why you have been ordained. It's possible that you became more preoccupied with peripheral issues rather than the critical pivot of your calling. And this night, you just want to tell God, I rededicate myself to your cause. I rededicate myself. The vows I took, I want to renew my vows before you tonight. Lord, I want you to strike my heart afresh and give me a newness, a new impetus, a new vision. Set me on fire, Lord. Where are you? You sense that God has to restore your fire. God has to redefine your purpose in ministry. God has to take away routine and give you the clarity, the pungent, sharpness to the ministry to which God has called you before. You want to recover it tonight. Let me request you to stand before God and say, Lord, for me, my years must not go on like this. You must restore my life afresh. Lord, I must regrip the reason why you called me. Maybe God gave you a vision before you came out. The whole thing is now dead. It's locked up in the midst of routine. You want to say, Lord, I'm raising my hand to you. I want to, I want to catch again the fire. I want to catch again the very reason why you caught me. Lord, tonight, Tonight, here am I. Tonight, Lord, here am I. Maybe you are getting disappointed with church members because you forgot. You forgot. Maybe you are even looking at other colleagues of yours in the communion. How they are lazy. And you say, well, it's not you alone. You forgot that they were not there when God called you. Tell God this night, renew my fire. Rekindle my fire. Set me ablaze again. That quench unquenchable test your heart to see the glory of God, to see so saved is dead. Restore me, O oh God. Restore me this night. Restore my life tonight. Touch me again. Touch me once more. I couldn't come to Umtata only just to attend a conference. I must go back with my fire. Tell God, Lord, I'm going back with my fire. I'm going back with the message you gave me before. Sharpen my implement again. Sharpen my life again. Set me on fire again. Don't let me get lost in the midst of administration. Lord, touch me again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. As you raise those two hands to God, we are saying, Lord, set me ablaze again. I want to recover my fire again. That body that took me out all the way before, Lord, set it back to me. Make me restless again until I see your glory in the land of the living. Lord, help me tonight. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Okay. 
the Lord says there are those that decided to withdraw from their calling because of the oppositions. You find yourself withdrawing from your calling. You know what God called you to do. But as you face opposition, you change your position. And now you are a man without position. You are not floating. Your ministry doesn't have bearing again because you left your call. God is asking you, come back. Come back. God will not evaluate you about all those other things you are doing. Your position that is now vacant is what everyone is going to demand and say, I posted you to do this. Where are you? Let this night be a restoration. We are standing to God in prayer. Several of us, we have a need. Some of us, we just want to recover our fire. Some of us, we have not left our position, but we have become stagnant. Some of us, we are occupying the place, but we are not doing anything with it anymore. We have become official. Lord, restore my fire. Can I pray together with you tonight? Lord, restore our fire. Lord, restore to us our first love that burden you gave us when we first knew you the reason why you captured us and we couldn't do otherwise bring it back to us tonight whatever it is that made it to go all the way to it please Lord arise on our behalf tonight and do something new Lord, I stand together with my brothers, my sisters, our colleagues in this call. We are not going to end as casualties. We lift up our two hands to you, Lord. Come to us again. Come to us afresh. As you recommission Jonah, Recommission us again. Lord, even though time has been wasted, time is lost, yet you can help us to recover. We are praying, oh God, for a recovery. We are pleading with you, Lord, that you give us another opportunity. Let there be a fresh moment in our ministries. Lord Jesus, do a new thing with us. Do a new thing, oh God. Do a new thing, oh God. Some of us, Lord, our gifts have become dormant. Our implements have become rusty. The sharpness of our utterance are finished. Where we go to engage in many other things. Father, restore unto us the fire we used to have with you. Give us fresh the vision of your glory. Bring a divine compulsion to our spirit. Our brother Paul said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Lord, we ask, bring back a divine compulsion on our spirit. That thing that will make us restless, sleepless, until we see your glory come to pass. Lord, I'm praying that the parishes, the dioceses, the churches, where these men come from, let there be fire in the name of Jesus. Lord, 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 start with us, O oh God. Start again with us, Lord. We lift up our hands to you. You have not allowed death to finish with us. Because if it had happened, we don't know what would have, where we would have faced. We don't know how many blood of men will be requested from our hands. Tonight, Lord, as you give us another opportunity to live, 
Not bit by bit, we will offer our whole lifetime for you to fulfill your purpose. Those, oh God, who left their position and they are floating about, please restore them. Those whom the devil threatened to keep silent, Lord, please encourage them today. Those that sin cut short as you have something, cause their air to go again, cause their anointing to restore to their lives again. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Unto you who is able to do more than we could ask or imagine, we commend ourselves. Please, Lord, give increase to this night's meeting. Let this meeting be done unto revival in our churches. Then men say, what has happened to our pastor? What has happened to our vicar? Something has happened to him. He's a different man now. Do it for us. Thank you for hearing. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.